So welcome everybody. Uh, we're uh, going to pick up our today's uh, distinguished uh, lectures, um, and uh, we're very happy um, to have a our, our speaker today being uh, Eric Benson, um, who is I'm echoing a little bit here, um, who is uh, going to be joining us here at Berkeley um, and is in the process of, of moving here already. Um, so I was just uh, speaking to his, his, his wife the other day, and I understand they still have you know, lots of boxes in, in the house, but I assured him that after 15 years, I still have lots of boxes in my house, so it's, <laughs> it's a fair deal. Um, so Eric uh, is, is a, uh, a physicist uh, originally uh, as an undergrad at Caltech, and then he went on to Cornell, where he did his doctoral work, um, and that was involved with the development of near-field optics, and, uh, which was, of course, the first method to break that diffraction barrier in light, micros my light microscopy. Uh, Eric conducted research then at at and Bell Labs, um, where he further refined the technology and explored many applications, including high-density data storage and semiconductor spectroscopy and super-resolution fluorescence imaging of cells. In 1993, Eric was the first person to image uh, single fluorescent molecules under ambient conditions and determine their position to better than 1 40th of the wavelength of light. After a brief stint in corporate R&D, Eric went on to invent and demonstrate a super resolution technique called POM, uh, along with his former colleague from Bell Labs, Harold Hess. And then in 2014, Eric won the Nobel Prize in chemistry for his work developing super resolution fluorescence microscopy, which allows scientists to look inside cells and see the pathways of individual molecules. Now, he's worked since 2005 at the HHMI Genelia Farm Research Campus, and is now moving to Berkeley and establishing a new imaging center called AIC, for Advanced Imaging Center. <laughs> I don't know, it, it may, may sound a little more euphonious. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I personally um, have uh, enjoyed starting to get to know Eric, and I, and I can report that you know, my feeling about a scientist is uh, that you want to have that sense of playfulness and willingness to just try things. And I, I definitely have the impression that this is uh, where Eric has done, everything he's done, has come from that kind of spirit. Mm -hmm. So, Buck Merrick, and I look forward to your talk. Thanks, so. <laughs> All right, thanks, everybody. And uh, I have to admit, I'm giving this talk with some trepidation, because I actually, this is one of the first talks in a long time I actually crafted for my audience, because I need data scientists so badly in my work right now, and so this is a, very much a plea, a lot of what I'm saying here, okay? So while the microscope's been around for 400 years, it really kind of reached a level of maturity back in the 1880s when Ernst Abbe and Otto Schott were able to work together to make microscope objectives that got down to this theoretical limit of the diffraction limit. In fact, it was so good that for the next 100 years, while things like, you know, electric lights got better and so forth, the microscope you could buy in 1980 wasn't significantly different from the one that you would buy in 1880. Um, but then things changed. The first thing was accessible, cheap computers, which allowed you to automate microscopes. And then the second thing was the development of the CCD sensor, um, originally a memory device at Bell Labs, but astronomers picked up on this first, and by 79 this was put on telescopes, and shortly thereafter, was going to the Sony camcorders and then trickled into the microscopy community. So the first technique, the first version of digital imaging was what was called video microscopy. And there's many benefits, increased contrast, the ability to see subwavelength structures, and the ability to gently look at the dynamics of living cells by differential interference contrast and record all of that with your camera. Typical data rates in that era were about a quarter megabyte per second. So um, the next big advance was in part due to the laser, which although it appeared in 1960, didn't become really widely available and robust enough and cheap enough for microscopes until the 80s. But then the other was fluorescence. So fluorescence has been around since antiquity and dyes and so forth but the ability to attach those dyes to antibodies that would then find specific targets inside of the cell and light them up and make them glow became a very, very powerful technology by the 80s, in part because of the antibodies and in part because the lasers could pr create pure enough light to be able to identify specific proteins inside of the living things. And a typical cell has about 10 to 20,000 different types of proteins 
doing a nutty dance and there's about 37 trillion of these things inside your body and, um, and to be able to see every single piece is what a reductionist like me as a physicist would like to be able to do. So the next stage was then in the 90s, or actually in the 80s going to the 90s, was the realization that when you're staring at these things with a regular microscope, there's a lot of out-of-focus background in three-dimensional samples. So people would use a scanning laser spot and collect the light and filter it through a pinhole to reject all the out-of-focus light that was called confocal microscopy. So it would do something called optical sectioning that you would only see one plane in the specimen at a time. You could drive that up and down and get your 3D image like you see here. So data rates were typically on the order of a tenth to one megabyte per second. This instrument is ubiquitous even today in labs everywhere, the confocal microscope. Um, but the next stage was the trouble with the immunofluorescence technique I described with these antibodies is you had to kill the cell and blow holes in it to put the antibodies in. So you weren't going to look at anything live. So the next big advance was in 94 when Chalfie and others developed green fluorescent protein. So you could coax the cell to produce any protein you want with a little fluorescent label on it. And then you could therefore do live imaging with fluorescence, which was extremely powerful. What made it more powerful was when they developed confocal microscopes that had not just one spot of light, but massive arrays of spots of light by which you could then scan much faster and get much higher data rates. So this is considered sort of the high, it's very ubiquitous, it's very high end as a type of microscope that you see in imaging course today, these spinning disc confocal microscopes. But the combination of the laser, cheap computing, great detectors, mix that all together and all of a sudden you can put this together in many, many different ways and so there was sort of a Cambrian explosion of all sorts of different microscopy techniques from the 90s till today. They, they fall in many categories, but two of them are techniques to do multicellular imaging, like two photon microscopes that use infrared light that can penetrate far into the brain or other tissues, adaptive optics like astronomers use to correct for sample-induced aberrations in multicellular specimens, and light sheet microscopy, which pierces the sample with a sheet of light and sweeps that vertically through the sample to get a 3D image much more quickly than you can with a scanning spot and much more gently too. The other class are the super resolution microscopes. Uh, th the three biggest categories are structured illumination, stimulated emission depletion, and the one I was involved with, single molecule localization microscopy. So all of a sudden everybody had lots of tools at their disposal. But the real problem that resulted was the embarrassment of riches that happened because of these techniques, in particular because of this little beast. The CMOS camera that came along, the scientific CMOS, <laughs> basically supplanted CCD technology because it was cheap and it was blindingly fast and it was low noise. And it's basically, any kind of imaging science has basically been overwhelmed by this. A, a $10,000 camera will produce three terabytes per hour if it's running flat out. So basically we are literally drowning. On my personal server in my lab at Janelia, we have almost a petabyte of data, okay? And most of it remains unanalyzed because it's just too damn hard. Too damn hard to transport the data, navigate the data, analyze the data, visualize the data. They're all problems, okay? So I'm gonna give some examples of where we've tried to attack this analysis problem based on one of the microscopes we developed in our lab called the lattice light sheet microscope. So this is, like I say, a light sheet microscope will sweep through a specimen or the specimen will sweep through a sheet and you get one image per plane and you build up a 3D image. With the lattice, you use these non-diffracting beams, they're called, to make a particularly thin light sheet so that you have much higher axial resolution than a traditional light sheet and it's better suited to looking at the subcellular dynamics inside of single cells. So uh, we published this paper in 2014, and here's several examples of 3D uh, migration in a collagen mesh, a pond protozoan, um, a slime mold amoeboid. Um, here's an early worm in its development. 
So if you watch this movie, you'll see like this little lightning bolt, which will come around and then go again. And so when we render that movie for the first time, our collaborator says, what the hell was that? And we said, we don't know. You're the biologist. You tell us. And so, you know, I don't want to pat my back too much, but I have never felt more like Galileo than with the lattice light sheet microscope because we've had 70 different groups come to our lab. All of them stay for a week or two at a time, take 10 terabytes of data, go away with big smiles on their faces, and then call us up a month later crying because they have no idea what to do with 10 terabytes of data. Okay. <laughs> and so of that sort of petabyte of data, much of that is copies of these people data they've had in their hands. To this day, I'll show you examples where data we took in 2013 just came out in a paper now. Okay. And that's the best people with the best ability to analyze the data. The vast majority of the data we've taken is still unpublished, still unanalyzed, because people are just overwhelmed by the data. Okay. So let me give you three examples where it worked. So this is with a group from uh, uh, Cell and Developmental Bi Biology of Rikin in Japan, where they were studying uh, when cells divide, there are these cables called microtubules that pull the chromosomes of the daughter cells apart. The ends of growing microtubules have a protein on them that ends up making looking like this fireworks that you see here. And so that fireworks is a marker of where a microtubule is growing. So if you follow the track of that, you can see how the microtubule is lengthening. So um, all of that is great but they wanted to understand exactly where these microtubules were originating from. And if it, when it re, these microtubules can also retract, in which case you don't know what happened because there's no marker on there, so you get confused. So they, had to, they took about, what, 400 cells worth of data, probably about 20 terabytes in two weeks. And so the first thing they had to do is they used these centrosomes, which are the organizing centers that pull the, the daughter cells apart as a coordinate system. So first they figured out computationally how to fix that. Then they went through all the phases of cell division. All these have biological names for different phases and tracked every single one of these endpoints, figure out the velocities, their trajectories, and so forth. And then they used the cell and these centrosomes as a coordinate system from the center where the chromosomes are out to the centrosomes and looked at these tracks in every different region and they also found out the directions of the tracks. And what they were able to show is even though we couldn't see the microtubules directly, by doing this they were able to show that near the centrosomes all the microtubules have to follow a particular trajectory, but at the very center they go in very kinked and crazy directions that are not plausible to arrive from the centrosomes. And so by doing this they were able to show that there's the creation of new microtubules near the very center, near the chromosomes in cell division, which was a sort of, uh, what is it, controversial topic at the time, but they were able to resolve by doing this analysis. So um, a second example is um, looking at the organelles, the various components inside of the cell. So you could call this a schematic of a cell, but I actually call it a caricature. This is the kind of thing you would see in a textbook because this has the real picture looks nothing like that. It's, it's, it's just not like that. So we worked with Jennifer Lippincott Schwartz at Janelia with the lattice microscope and labeled six different organelles at the same time. Now normally many, 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 many studies in cell biology look at two or three organelles at a time, usually in 2D, often in fixed cells, sometimes in live cells. So here by unmixing the overlapping spectra computationally, we're able to see six organelles at the same time. You could split those out individually as you see here. But what we found is that um, first off we were able to determine how much space inside of the cell each organelle um, samples over time. And we found the endoplasmic reticulum, which is the biggest organelle, actually sweeps out the entirety of the cell every 10 minutes. And in many ways it's a driver of what happens inside of the cell because what you find is that there, you can't think of organelles in isolation. The point of this paper is that organelles are always contacting one another at different points inside of the cell. And furthermore, you can get multiple organelles which come together at a point and do some kind of function inside of the cell. Now, if all you're left with, like a normal cell biologist, is you look at that pretty movie and say, yeah, that's really pretty, 
but your brain cannot understand what the hell is going on from that movie and it isn't until you break it down computationally like this that you can see these contexts, quantify who's contacting who, you find that there are ubiquitous contacts between the mitochondria and the endoplasmic reticulum which Jennifer calls a meta-organelle, that the whole thing together acts like its own new organelle and acts as an organizing center for all sorts of metabolic operations with third organelles that come in close to that. So um, a third example is one we did with uh, Dyke Mellons, who's at UCSF, across the bay. So they were studying motility of different um, like immune cells, neutrophils and so forth. This is in a collagen mesh. They worked with a group who developed a molecular visualization package called Chimera at UCSF so that they could surface render these things. And then they could quantify, you see these kind of sheets that appear. Now it's kind of weird that something that's not right on a planar surface or even in a 3D system would create a planar sheet. So they wanted to see if this was a real effect. So they looked on both flat surfaces and 3D and found out, sure enough, in both cases, you do get these planar sheets. They're very stereotypical in both cases and how thick they are. And furthermore, as these sheets start to develop and grow out and get bigger and, and so forth, their thickness stays very constant, which suggests that all of this is due to actually the way the actin protein, which creates the cytoskeleton, polymerizes to create this sheet independent, kind of like a crystal, creating sort of a, a, a certain type of structure regardless of its surroundings. Um, they were also able to then look at and quantify the lifetimes of these sheets and their sizes in this direction. They were able to put in something which disrupts the actin cytoskeleton and show that these sheets basically go away. Um, in fact, they were able to show that this ARP23 is the main driver of creating these sheets. And furthermore, the sheets are, they found by tracking the directions of the cells, is essential for them to be able to turn in different directions by having these sheets. And if they knock that out with this inhibitor, that basically the cells can still move, but they're forced to go in a straight line. So, so those are three examples where we've had successes tiny, tiny fraction of all that data we took, but a few successes where people were able to create nice stories by doing the data analysis. But what are the lessons learned in my concerns? The complexity of this 4D or 5D data absolutely requires quantitative analysis because a human brain cannot really get itself around data of that complexity. Um, the one of, the, one of the lessons learned from this is that we take all of this data and in the lattice light sheet you're taking all of these 2D images and it isn't until long after you've done the experiment that you go to a workstation, you have the deconvolved data and you render this as a volume and you make a movie and you say, shit, that cell really sucked. Okay, we waste a lot of time on that. Real-time visualization, smart microscope, like what Laura Waller talks about, would be a dream for all of us. The ability to have some kind of ability to see the cell as it is in 4D or 5D as we're taking the data to know whether we should cut it off or continue taking data or even better yet getting some, some minor bit of data analysis coming out to know that we're on the right track and is worth investing two weeks and 20 terabytes in doing this would be huge. Um, as I said before, almost all of our users are ill-equipped to handle the data that we hand to them. And that's the end of it. What's 5D? I'm sorry. 5D would be, in this case, X, Y, Z, time, and wavelength. Okay. Wow. okay. So, Thank yeah. Uh -huh. We're going to go to more dimensions in a minute, though. <laughs> okay. uh, the other thing that, that, that depresses me is I'm not a data scientist, and you guys are probably real good at finding commonalities between different problems. But when I look at the three examples I just showed by way of example, I'm at a loss to see how I could write an algorithm that would allow me, that would be uniform across those three problems. And we have hundreds if not thousands of problems presented to us, each as unique. And so that is a really daunting part of this. Um, 
there are, again, all sorts of open source libraries for different things like particle tracking, which is a low-hanging fruit. Or I think about, if you guys know from the imaging field, Fiji or, or ImageJ or stuff like that. I mean, it's, <clears throat> you know, ImageJ is a good example where it's pretty easy to use unless you're 58 like me and there's all sorts of new toolboxes there and you're like, oh, fuck, what did they do now, you know? And then you're, you're like, and even then, that's, ch that's child's play. It's a toy for the type of analysis that you have to do in this stuff. And so I'm an engineer and I'm a systems integrator and this perpetual trade-off between flexibility versus ease of use in any design and certainly code is one that I don't know exactly how we solve. Um, that's what I'm saying here. Um, this is not National Institutes of Health. It's not invented here. Um, that works against everybody says the code of the last guy sucks. I have to rewrite it because it doesn't work well. That kills us all the time, okay? The guy who programs all of our microscopes, the brains behind it, I've had the same guy for 10 years, and as a result, our microscopes run like a top, and they have a very standardized set of dialogues. The thing of putting in a new postdoc every three years or a new grad student, it's death to getting anywhere on this type of stuff. Um, my other concern is even if we solved all of these problems, Changes in the hardware that's available. The programming languages are always changing, damn it. And then the algorithms themselves will get better. And so everything that you have one year is going to be obsolete in two years thereafter. So this is, anyway, I, Saul says that I'm a guy who likes to play. I do love to play. But I am the most pessimistic bastard you will ever meet. And I'm always thinking about what the problems are. And there's a lot of problems, okay. So, um, so anyway. So let's continue to make the problem even more difficult now. So everything I've discussed has been about looking at single cells moving around. But God damn it, they didn't evolve on a cover slip. They evolved inside of an organism. And the, we know that the behaviors we observe and the physiology we observe is the result of gene expression. That gene expression is controlled by the environment. So if the environment is wrong, how can we believe anything we get out of looking at single cells? Okay, so again, I'm the pessimist, all right? So anyway, so the problem of doing multicellular imaging is it's damn hard in an optical microscope because with a light sheet, for example, it will get scrambled by the different refractive indices of the material as it goes in, so it gets blooms and gets dim over here, or the, light, the fluorescence generated by the light sheet for these guys, it has to penetrate the embryo, and so it gets all scrambled. So it's like water on your windshield, and you're kind of screwed. So good news is astronomers solved that problem long before us. So the idea is adaptive optics, where you can basically close a loop and use a deformable mirror to measure the aberration inside of the sample, correct for it, and bing, you can get good results. Same principle works well. In biology, we use a two-photon laser to create a guide star of light, and then we look at the distortions on that guide star, just as they do in astronomy, change the shape of a mirror, and we get much better signal, much better resolution, get back to what it would be like if we were looking at a cell on a cover slip instead of it being buried deeply in an organism. So here's a couple examples of this. So this is with Dave Drubin and Dirk Hockemeyer here in MCB at Berkeley where we're looking at um, these uh, um, stem cells, which can be um, uh, differentiated and made into organoids, in this case, an intestinal organoid. And David's interest is in clathrin-mediated endocytosis. So the surface of the cell is the gateway. And there's these little particles that bud off from the plasma membrane and carry cargos called clathrin-coated pits. So they want to study this process of endocytosis in these organoids at all sorts of points in the organoids at different times. So this becomes a particle tracking problem. If you watch this movie scroll around, you could see without the adaptive optics, there's nothing but a fuzz. You can't see the particles at all. But with the adaptive optics, they become very clear. And then it just becomes a damn big problem because they took 107 data sets with 30 terabytes of data. And so this is where Yo, the, bid, the bids fellow sitting right there, comes in the picture because Yo is trying to create algorithms that are much more efficient than what we did in that one quick example and parallelizable so we can try to handle that 30 terabytes of data 
and get all the information that David would like to get out of that. Um, this is another example where, where now we're doing that not in an organoid, but in an actual whole living organism, in this case a zebrafish, which is our favorite model organism. It's a small little vertebrate fish, genetically tractable, and what you can see is there's different brightnesses of these clathrin spots that represent clathrin plaques on the inside of blood vessels in the fish, big clusters, like clusters of grapes that these clathrin particles create in the um, blood vessels that they don't create in the muscle cells. It also then gives us the ability to look at other organs, so we move our microscope to other parts of the fish and find, for example, that the endocytosis is significantly faster in the brain than it is in muscle cells throughout the fish. Um, again, we can study multiple organelles at the same time as I showed before, but now in a multicellular system. So you can, again, it's too goddamn complex to study when you have not just one cell now with multiple organelles, but cells on top of cells on top of cells. So Gokul, Yupata Hayalu, and Tom Kierkhausen's group is a fantastic coder. And so he adapted some programs from NIH which allows him to then segment and then computationally segment the cells so that then you can come in and study any one you want. So in this case, for example, here's a dividing cell and the endoplasmic reticulum, instead of being that net that you saw earlier, forms these sheets at that point. Um, and then you can see in different organs again, like again, the brain has much bigger Golgi normalized to the size of the cell than in other organs. So these two datum about the, the uh, endocytosis rate and the Golgi size suggests that the trafficking of cargos inside of these early brain cells in development is far faster than in other cell types. Now as we go further along, we can zoom in on a particular cell like this one. Now remember, this has got the time axis to this data set as well. So we took 200 time points of data and we're going to follow that cell, split out each of its three organelles, and this and then also track the position of these organelles with respect to the cell membrane and also um, the, uh, the surface area and volume of the cell. You find that the volume stays constant throughout cell division, but the surface area takes a big dip because the cells all round up when this happens, and the organelles all change their shape during that period. And here's a case where the division was not symmetric as it normally is, but an asymmetric division in that case. So we can study all of that. Um, here's examples, again, now doing cell motility like we did with Dyke Mullins, but now doing it actually in vivo. So there's a neutrophil like we saw before, but now it's a neutrophil in the ear of a live fish. So now we have a much more complicated system and reference system if we're going to be doing any kind of quantification on this kind of thing. Um, you could imagine, for example, in this case, this is looking at a model of metastasis where you take a zebrafish and you squirt human breast cancer cells in them, and then ultimately you'll watch these things metastasize and pull out of the blood vessels. So one could imagine um, in a perfect world with, with, uh, with the data resources uh, devoted to it, that, one, that the best way to be able to do image-based drug screening is to do this in models where we're doing all of this in vivo instead of, you know, 96 well or much bigger plates or 384 or whatever. Um, and so the whole idea of being able to do in vivo screening is something I'm very interested in exploring long term. Here you're watching the wiring of a neural circuit and you're watching the axons as they go along this track over time. So what's the lessons from this? Um, microscopy in the modern age is highly multidimensional. First you have the four dimensions of space time. You have multicolor, and because of the breadth of the colors, you're usually limited to you know, four, five, or six colors. But remember, there's 10,000 plus different types of proteins. So that means if you want to do this, then you have to create cells, boom, 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 that have a different four colors in each case. That's what the Allen Cell Atlas is doing, is they're creating a huge library of cells that all have different things labeled in it so that then they can do screens with that. Um, then you want to do different perturbations. So in the da data we took with David, they did all sorts of perturbations with drugs onto those clathrin um, organoids. And then we need to analyze that axis. Um, if you're doing an image-based screen, 
Oftentimes you do RNA interference to knock down the effect of a given protein, or you can do CRISPR-Cas9 to completely knock out a protein. But there's many, many perturbations one could apply. Cell type, now that we have this multicellular ability, we're not just picking one cell type like a COS cell or a U2S cell or what cell biologists normally do. You're now putting different species in your microscope. They have different organs. Each organ, like the brain, will have dozens of different cell types within that organ. And so you'd like to explore all of that. Um, you'll take the data and you'll optimize to see one thing like, gee, that's moving really fast, so we better take the data fast. Gee, that's really small, we better take the data slower, but focus on that. Gee, that thing is going to curl up and die if we look at it. So you might want to take the same data in different ways in order to optimize different imaging parameters. <coughs> and on top of all of that, you've got to remember the, the reason life works is because it is stochastic at the single molecule level. It, variability is built into life. And so if you take one measurement with all of that, you are not necessarily seeing anything representative. You have to have high N to get the statistical significance to see trends. Um, one thing that we can help even before we get to the microscope is just having tools that can data mine the literature well and figure out what has already been explored, what hasn't been explored, what's worth being explored, and so forth, to try to minimize the number of cells in this multi-dimensional matrix that we have to explore. That would be extremely valuable. Um, and again, all of this stuff, like I said, has implications for next generation drug discovery. So, um, so all of that's fine in terms of, you know, uh, um, of, of how difficult the problem is. Now I'm going to show you some examples where it's not just a matter of getting good data and analyzing it. It's where data science has been absolutely essential to get the data in the first place. Okay? So one example is, is the technique that got me my Nobel, single molecule localization microscopy, where if that's a molecule, that's the size it looks like in an optical microscope. And the problem is, is that in a biological sample, they're so close they all overlap. But if you have a special kind of fluorescent molecule, you can turn them on one by one, and then they're likely isolated by bigger than the fuzzy ball. I think we can all point to the center of the fuzzy ball. Computers are really good at doing that. And so you find the location of that molecule, you turn that one off, turn on others, and eventually you go. This is developed with my buddy Harold Hess. Um, you go from this type of image to this, or to better appreciate from that to that. So um, this is a multivesicular body inside of a cell. So that, that technique is fairly common, but it's difficult to do. And like all the super resolution methods that won the Nobel, there's real challenges. And they all come down to the fact that we're using fluorescence. So you've got to remember that the thing you care about is some protein inside of your sample. And the fluorescent molecule is, is something else that's it's not inherently there that has to come and attach to it. It's an indirect reporter of the protein molecule you care about. So for example, if I want to see a pattern like that, if I don't have enough of these fluorescent molecules, all I see is spots. And it isn't until I have many, many that I start to resolve that structure. The other problem is, is that most of the time, there's some linker that connects the protein molecule to that fluorescent molecule. So you have the uncertainty of this linker that swings your fluorescent molecule around in a sphere relative to the protein. So this is a simulation I did where you take an EM as ground truth of the actin cytoskeleton. If you use fluorescent proteins that have a short linker, you get this. If you use antibodies, it seems pretty hopeless. And almost all the time it is hopeless, except for a beautiful paper that came out of EMBL in 2013, where they were looking at nuclear pores, which are these little holes in the nuclear membrane through which RNA passes going in and out of, out of the nucleus. And they used antibody labeling, and it was crappy. And they got all of these crappy little images of these rings for different proteins in the subunit that create this bigger structure, this ring-like structure. But what they did is they averaged thousands and thousands of these crappy images and they ended up determining with less than nanometer precision the radius on which each of those proteins sit. 
From that, they were able to determine which way the subunit sits in the nuclear pore. This may sound familiar if you know anything about cryo-EM because this particle averaging is the basis by which that technology, which just won the Nobel, works. The cryo-EM had, a, had, a, um, had sort of a non-uniqueness in the solution to the, to the nuclear pore where this subunit could lay either way, and it wasn't until they did the super-resolution particle averaging that they actually resolved that question. So another example, and again, again it, it, made, it made basically what was unusable in terms of super resolution create a truly unique result in the end, all because of data science, okay? Another example is, remember I said you have to have very high density of label, and it's very difficult to do that. Well, there is a type of label if you want to study membranes, which can go into the membrane directly without a linker at very high density, and then, um, and then you can see it if you just have these things come in at such a low concentration that only a few come in at a time, they appear as spots. So this is called paint, and we've been able to do that with our lattice light sheet in 3D, and here are some examples. One big surprise, though, as we were taking this data is you start loading up so much dye in the membrane that these things start to swell like balloons. The whole freaking cell starts to swell, and you're screwed because you're trying to localize one molecule on one day, and then two days later, we're still in the same scope, another molecule that you hope is 40 nanometers away, but if the whole thing is swelled by three microns, you're never gonna know it. So we worked with a, a data scientist at UPenn, Brian Evans, who was able to apply this transformation over time, and you can see the swelling version versus his corrected version that allowed us to get things good to within about 40 nanometers. This technology would have been completely unusable Without that, without him basically pulling uh, pulling us uh, back to reality. So um, a final example where um, where big data meets really big data in super resolution is something we've got involved with with Ed Boyden's group at MIT called expansion microscopy. So this sounds like a completely nutty idea, where you take something like a fly brain and then you infuse it with a polymer gel, and then you cross-link your fluorophores to the polymer gel, and you bring in a protease which digests away all the biological goop, so now you have a polymer with some fluorescence in it, and then you change the osmotic balance and that polymer swells, and so what you got is a phantom of your original brain, which is nothing but polymer and water, which is some multiplicative factor bigger than the original thing. I What's that? It's a, fossil. it's a fossil. There you go. It, I thought this idea was completely insane when I heard about it. I thought it would never work reliably at the nanoscale. And most of the time, in many samples, it doesn't. The thing doesn't go uniformly and so forth. There are two systems which we've worked with Ed where it does work, the fly brain and the mouse brain. The good news is that there's a lot of interest in the fly brain and the mouse brain. So, particularly at Genelia. So, here's an example of that, <clears throat> where we are looking across the entire width of the cortex of a mouse, which means in unexpanded coordinates going two millimeters. If you guys could have any appreciation for how much effort it has been in the super resolution field to even look at a 50 micron field and how much, you know, effort, hours that you would spend to get an image like that, the thought of imaging millimeters in just a couple days, in this case, six terabytes of data at this type of resolution, is just amazing that you could do that. But the only way we could do that is the problem is you put that guy in a microscope, it's a swelled little jello-like thing, you turn the microscope on, the lattice scope, and what happens? Well, the damn thing starts to shrink and swell over time and do whatever, and so if I've got one tile of data I'm taking one place and then 48 hours later I come back to the adjacent tile, it may not overlap at all. The guy who saved our bacon was data scientist at Genelia, Stefan Saufeld, who figured out this very, you know, non-uniform warping that he was able to apply and basically, you can't do kind of any kind of rigid um, uh, based, based on stage coordinates type stitching. You can't just do image correlation, it doesn't work. 
you have to do more magic than goes way over my head that Stefan was able to do. But this thing was nothing but a pig when we were done with it. And Stefan put the prettiest lipstick on that pig you can imagine <laughs> and made it so that this data was actually usable in the end. So these purple guys are markers of the synapses in antibodies as well. And so, you know, with this, you're then able to do quantification once he's done with it. So we worked with a company, Neurolucida, who sells this package to look at these dendritic spines that you see here. They had to completely rewrite their code for the higher resolution data that we gave them. But then we sampled seven different regions, looked at 1,500 of these dendritic spines, which are the points at which signals come into a neuron, and then understand the shape of these dendritic spines and look at how they differ in different layers of the mouse brain as we go along, whether it's the neck, which is sort of the highest, uh, um, highest uh, resistance part of the thing, the spine head, which creates the contact with the, uh, with, the, um, with the other side, with the axon on the other side, et cetera. So it's too bad this room is so light, but anyway, this is, this is a really pretty image of, in the scope you can put in an entire fly brain, and that's the love, if any of you guys knew Jerry Rubin from his old days, uh, I think he'd marry a fly if he could, but in, in any case, uh, this, this is the system that, that is the biggest inside of Janelli and most, most studied. But basically, you can put in a whole fly brain and then we can actually trace many of the neurons across the fly brain. In addition, there's a huge pipeline of doing electron microscopy at Janelia with a technique my buddy Harold developed called FibSim where um, you ablate a few nanometers at a time off a block that embeds your brain, image it by electron microscopy in a few nanometers, do, 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 do. Right now they've looked through this one little part here, which is called the mushroom body, and they've had annotators count the synapses inside of this little part called the alpha-3 lobe. They got 33,000 synapses there. Um, we can look at those synapses by our expansion technique do a similar analysis, we get 43,000, which is within the margin of error and the variability from specimen to specimen. But furthermore, we didn't spend weeks, months to get to that. We can look over the whole damn brain and tell you that there are 40 million synapses across the brain, half a million of which synapse onto the dopaminergic neurons in the brain. We can furthermore break that down into these various neuropil regions. This is the calyx here which is there in order to determine how the density of synapses changes in different anatomical regions. Um, and furthermore, break down any one of those regions into, um, into the distribution of densities inside of that region. Um, furthermore, because the data is so clean like that, it becomes, you know, one of the challenges with tracing EM data is it's all black and white and everything is there. And so it's a huge challenge to do tracing of all of the neurons there. The FibSem will make it possible, but it won't be quick. The advantage of fluorescence is you can label just a subset of neurons, and then it's very easy to trace as Yoshi did there. And, what he, and another experiment you can do is, it's because you take the data so much faster than other methods, you can look for, can we even assume the connectomics is going to be conserved from one um, guide to the next, and we're able to show that, in fact, there are differences in how these things wire up between different, between different animals. So and that's another example where, again, Stefan saved our bacon and made it possible to take this data. So um, now to sort of close some of the things for the future, so um, how can data an analysis help us in the future? One is if we had better compression. So this is a paper I just saw in BioArchive a week or two ago that looks sort of interesting to do extreme compression of biological data by not representing as pixels but as particles, whatever that means. Um, so they can get compressions of, you know, 15 to 50. The downside is it takes forever to do the compression, and so that has to get sped up for this to be a plausible technology. Um, now also there's many opportunities to get somewhere I think in the future from machine learning. Here's a couple examples. This is one of Stefan's problems. So I told you about Harold's FibSim and how great it is. The problem is we have to have 10 of these running because it's gonna take months even with 10 to get through one brain. 
a much older technology is to section the, um, the brain mechanically about 60 nanometers thick instead of four nanometers thick and then do that, but then you're undersampling the resolution that you could have in the Z direction. So what Stefan does is he used the FibSim data as the ground truth in a training set to then look back at the TM data and then try to predict what it should have been based on that training and then teach the machine to work with TM data and get better. It's not perfect, but you can certainly take the crappy TM data a lot longer and farther than you could without it. Here's another paper that just appeared on BioArchive, which was kind of interesting, from the Allen Cell Institute. So I have a love-hate relationship with fluorescence because it has this tremendous sensitivity, this power to look at individual proteins, but it also bleaches, it's exogenous to the cell, it's a mess. Um, so what they did here is they looked at a bunch of just either bright field or differential interference contrast unlabeled cells, and, and what they did is they compared it to a training set where they also did fluorescence, and ultimately they're able to predict just based on the differential interference contrast images, what the distribution of different proteins are inside of the cell. Of course, they picked three cases, which I know from personal experience, are gonna be the three easiest to, that will have a, a nice signature in the bright field image. And I would say the vast majority of proteins would have no chance just based on a DIC image to see. But it kind of gets me thinking that, you know, this is some of Harold's FibSim data here, just a tiny, tiny piece of it. Um, we're working with Harold in my group with a cryogenic super resolution fluorescence microscope to do correlative imaging to get the global contrast that he provides with a protein specific contrast that optics can provide without having fixation because it's cryogenically frozen. And so here you can see the distribution of two different proteins for the mitochondria and the endoplasmic reticulum overlaid on the EM image. So I'm thinking that even the best palm data is not as beautiful as Harold's um, FibSim data. But if we can use the palm data to basically train the, from the SEM data, we can say, look at the SEM data and say, look, this, this is what we expect to see on the basis of this. And then we could train or even, you know, um, make the, the, basically colorize the EM data in the end at EM-based resolution based on the information we get from enough super resolution data. And then the super resolution is just used to bootstrap and sort of error check to make sure that we're getting the right features in the end. So that could be huge. If we had an instrument like this here on campus and could pull in the machine learning in order to make that happen and validate it with fluorescence microscopy, this would revolutionize structural biology on this sort of mesoscale, which is far bigger than the cryo-EM level, but much smaller than the optical level. So um, all of that being said, you might think that based on all this fantastic stuff I showed you, that everybody's using these technologies now and everybody loves them. Well, that ain't so, all right? The vast majority of microscopists are doing stuff just like they were doing in the 80s and 90s, okay? And there's lots of reasons for that. These new microscopes are costly, complex, and difficult to use. Um, they come along with complex sample preparation and you have to plan your experiments carefully. Um, and again, as I said, we get lots of nice data for people, but it doesn't mean much if they can't analyze the data. And that's where you guys come in, and we need that. Um, and many labs, they want to be vertically integrated. They want to be able to do everything inside their thing. Graduate students are, are a timid lot, and sometimes going across campus to even an imaging center is a little stressful for them or something. And so they'd rather be vertically integrated. And, and probably, you know, the cynic in me says, well, the reason they still do this is because they can still publish papers and get grant money. And as long as that happens, they don't really have a motivation to change, okay? So, um, so one thing that you have to do if you don't have that instrument in your thing is to go to an imaging center. And imaging centers have been around as long as microscopes have been around. And in my opinion, that they serve their purpose, but the problem is, is, is that they're really kind of designed, in my opinion, for the microscope that existed in 1980 
where basically you could have a bunch of these, of these instruments that were simple enough that you just train somebody for a little while, they use it themselves, they take their pictures, they go away, they analyze their data themselves, and they write their paper. Um, so there's instrument and training provided, but biologists are usually expected to run the instruments after the training. They're expected to analyze their own data. The staff are usually overworked and undertrained because there's too few of them for usually the number of microscopes. And usually you do a charge back, so it's up to, you have to, to get people in, they have to pay for it, and so that kind of is limiting as well. So um, because of the difficulty and complexity of these advanced microscopes, uh, one of the ways we try to get around this at Genelia is with more foundation money and Genelia money to create an advanced imaging center where we could have these crazy advanced microscopes. So while I have my petabyte, they have their petabyte from all the collaborators using these types of microscopes through the AIC. They now actually have an embedded data scientist to help them, which has helped. But to a large degree, they've fallen in the same trap that I fell in in my own group, is that there just isn't enough data analysis manpower and firepower to help too many people. Okay? Um, and so what I'd like to do here at Berkeley is to create a next generation AIC. We also already have the space over in Barker. And I would like this to be under a slightly different model. Because when you think about the cost and the complexity of these instruments, what's a better analogy than a regular imaging center? It seems to me the ALS is the best analogy. You should think of this like a beam line, okay? And to a degree, that's, the, that's sort of the way the Genelia AIC works, is that um, we, you, we take a whole bunch of proposals, we vet these proposals, we decide on who's going to come. We do long consultations with them before they ever show up. We figure out exactly what needs to happen on what day and whatever, just like it were a beam line. And rather than having it, you know, here you train the guy and then he goes off and does his thing, there needs to be this tight and continuous feedback loop right from the time that the proposals are looked at. And the data scientists can have a huge contribution in how these, pro how these proposals are refined to get success for that data. So initial consultation is important. All the tools have to be on site to do sample preparation. In fact, with the AIC at Genelia, people send their samples weeks ahead, and we take care of them. We grow them up. We do transfections. We do whatever is necessary. So when they walk in the door, they're taking data. That's the kind of model that works for this sort of thing. You have to have basically dedicated scientists who know that instrument, who will run the instrument, and the biologist is sitting next to him and steering him and says, go there, go there, go there, okay? But, the, but you can't expect the biologist himself in two weeks to know how to run one of these instruments, okay? Um, you need dedicated data scientists to be involved throughout the process. And again, even before the data is being taken to know what quality of data, what are we trying to optimize when we take the data so the data scientist isn't left with a case of garbage in, garbage out, but has optimized data for his analysis, okay? Um, it should have an international user base, and it should have the cost borne by the center itself because it's difficult enough to get people to come use an imaging core if they're paying for it. If they're going to have to do something nutty like this, basically we need to pick up the cost. That's what we did with the AIC there. That's what I would like to do here. Um, I think this is a model that could be very effective, this sort of beamline model of how to deal with advanced microscopes. But my, it, the key element is the data scientist. I envision a center here that would have as many data scientists on, as FTEs inside of that center as the imaging people itself. That it would be that big, of, it's not like a fraction. It's like almost everything that goes through there has to have an embedded data scientist for each application that happens, okay, in order for that to work. So if we ever get the money, that's what I'd like to see. So with that, I thank you for your time. I don't know, I kind of went a little over, but not too bad. But anyway, uh, thanks, and I'm happy to take questions.